Good evening. I'm your host, Dr. Amina Fernandez Pilgrim. I'm a professor at UMass Boston in the Department of Africana Studies, and I'm happy to be with a special guest this evening, City Councilor at Large, Ayanna Presley. Welcome. Thank you for having me. Thank you for it's being here. Great to be with you, Doctor. I love to say that. Thank you. <laughs> and I love to be with a woman who's making history. Congratulations on all of your successes up to date. Thank you so very much. You're welcome. Yeah. I know that this is a crunch time for you. Yes. And so uh, I want to congratulate you on opening a new office this past few days. And, yes. Um, I want to ask you about some of the recent, um, the recent milestones that your campaign has had and some of the recent successes that you've had. Sure. One of them is very close to my heart. Um, which is your work with young women in the city and uh, the new committee that you established on women in healthy communities. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Absolutely. Um, so, you know, thanks um, to the residents of this city, uh, many of whom are watching. Uh, I was entrusted with the awesome responsibility, uh, elected for the first time four years ago, uh, to serve as one of four citywide city councilors. I'm an at-large Boston city councilor representing the entire city of Boston, about 625,000 people, uh, 22 neighborhoods. And I also have the humbling honor of being the first woman of color elected to the council in its 100 year plus history. Mm -hmm. And I'm currently the only woman serving on that body. And what I know is that government is stronger and more effective when it reflects the citizenry um, uh, that it represents, um, uh, that it serves. And so I believe um, I've added a different optic and perspective to the council, which ultimately has brought um, an increased value um, to ensure that the solutions that we develop are creative and comprehensive and fully informed. I think there was an oversight in issues that disproportionately impact women and girls. It was not malicious, um, but it was an oversight. Um, and that was because that optic, that perspective was not represented. Mm -hmm. So I believe um, that my joining the council has brought a diversity of perspective, opinion, and thought, and in turn, a diversity in advocacy. So in broad strokes, my work is about breaking cycles of poverty and violence uh, and doing what we can to reduce trauma. Okay. You recently um, hosted and, and led in a listening-only hearing yes. about the experiences of young women uh, and women, adult women in, with violence. Yes. Can you talk a little bit about that? Absolutely. Thank you for asking about it. Um, as a, I just thought it was very important. Um, I find that we don't achieve advances when it comes to policies if we don't first uh, begin to have a dialogue and a discourse about things. Um, you're more uh, successful in enlisting people uh, as stakeholders uh, in advancing policy initiatives um, when you first get them to talk about those issues. And so I have wanted to make sure that I'm challenging the minds of people and raising consciousness about issues, uh, including sexual violence, uh, really all forms of violence. I think uh, in the discourse to date, there's been a disproportionate focus on youth and street violence. Right. Um, and the reality is that um, young people don't spontaneously combust and suddenly become violent. We live in a violent world. Right. We are consumers of violence. Um, we are um, victims of violence, uh, perpetrators of violence, and violence begats violence. And so I really want to challenge the discourse when we talk about ending violence, that we name all forms of violence. Um, and so I convened uh, this listening only hearing. We often say that um, the best policies are data driven and the best data comes from the front line, people That's who right. are experiencing um, uh, you know, those, those challenges every day. And I think in our youth development um, programming, uh, too often girls are given short shrift. They're sort of the bottom rung. The first priority um, is probably uh, boys, and then co-ed, and then girls. And so I convened this hearing so that we could better understand how we can holistically ensure uh, the safety and well-being and support our girls uh, in their development, and ensure that we have gender responsive and gender specific programming. Yes, um, I really appreciate that, and I 
What I appreciate about your leadership in general is that you really have um, a heart for the people of Boston Thank and you. I think that shows in what you've done for, for young women and, and I also uh, see that connected to another piece of work that you were able to accomplish with um, families, uh, including family voices in uh, first response, uh, re responses to trauma and to homicide. Yes. Um, and can you talk a little bit about that, please? Yes. I find that, um, you know, issues that disproportionately impact women and girls. Um, notice I never say women's issues because right. there's no such thing. Right. And I think too often people try to silo and sort of marginalize these issues. That's but any true. issue that's impacting women and girls is impacting families and entire communities. That's right. uh, and is the business of this Boston City Council and I've made it my priority. And the same is true for violence. I think people try to silo and marginalize who was impacted by violence, who's impacted by trauma. Right. Um, and in representing the entire city, I really have seen it as my charge to challenge the consciousness of people and the sense of personal responsibility, to understand that we're all connected. Uh, the, uh, the public health of the individual, the family, and the community are inextricably linked. And so what happens in Roxbury is West Roxbury's problem. Uh, anything that breaks the bonds of community and erodes at the fabric of us is something that we all need to have stakehold in and be committed to working on. And so I convened uh, the first ever uh, listening only hearing uh, called Family Voices uh, some four years ago to hear from 300 plus families who have been impacted by homicide in this city. And it was not to finger point, um, it was really to give us a compass and a roadmap uh, to improve the services that we provide in the aftermath of a homicide. Because that goes a long way in breaking the cycle of violence when you can help those families who have been impacted get on a pathway to healing but also to better understand um, that violence is a manifestation of many other social determinants, uh, unemployment, underemployment, poverty. Um, and so there were very sobering uh, personal accounts by uh, loved ones who have uh, lost uh, their loved ones on the streets of Boston. And every life, any life that we lose, um, we all bear in that responsibility. And for every life that we save, how we can all share in that victory. Mm -hmm. What I sense from your descriptions is that um, talking about the interconnectedness of, of, of all of us uh, is not just a, a political speech. <laughs> it's something that you really value and believe. And I'm sure that that goes a long way to restoring the trust among our residents in city government. Um, yeah, and also, uh, possibly in matters of public safety. Yes. Um, can you talk a little bit more about trust? And you mentioned joblessness and other matters that can affect people's trust and people's faith in their day-to-day -day lives and yeah. in their government. You know, I think um, people might think that there are, are, are folks that don't participate civically mm -hmm. um, because they are apathetic. Right. I don't think that's true. I think um, often there are people that don't participate civically um, because they've been disappointed. Um, and so whatever we can do to restore their faith in government, and I want to be very clear in saying that, you know, government can't fix everything. We all have a role to play in promoting healthier communities uh, and incentivizing uh, business growth and development uh, and stabilizing our families. We all have a role to play. It's not that I'm just a big booster for government, but I am a big booster and a believer in good government. And with thoughtful, um, holistic uh, policies, uh, the impact that those, you know, that those policies can have on the everyday lives of people. Um, and so I do recognize that, that there are those who might be skeptical uh, and cynical about government, and especially many in our immigrant communities uh, come from places where um, you, can be uh, threatened uh, for organizing or politically participating. And so, you know, there are some who are fearful, uh, who are fearful, who are skeptical, who are cynical. Um, and so whatever we can do um, to honor the promises that we make, to restore that trust, um, I think goes a long way. Yeah, um, another initiative that piques my interest about your work is what you call ABC. Ayana's Big Challenge, yes. and I think that 
excuse me if I'm wrong, but I think that that hasn't gotten enough push, at least as much as I would like. Um, this evening, we have an audience of, a multicultural audience yeah. of uh, hopefully some professionals who might be able to help out in that initiative that has to do with mentoring. Thank um, you. Yeah, can yeah. you talk a little bit about yes. that? Yes, you know, I think the best gift that we can give any young person or any child um, that we can give our children, because they are our children, That's right. uh, is a stable adult. Um, you know, the numbers are staggering uh, when surveyed and we ask our young people if you were in distress or you had a need or you had a problem, is there an adult in your life that you could go to? Um, and by and large, they say no. And what I find is that with our young people, there isn't any lack of talent or intellect, but I do see a lack of aspiration and direction. And that's where mentors come in. That's the role and, and the impact and the difference that they can make in the life of a young person which is to inform that aspiration and to give them direction uh, and to be a role model uh, and to provide a shoulder and an attentive ear and some hand-holding uh, when necessary. Uh, I'm very passionate about mentoring uh, and the benefits of it. It's cost-effective, uh, it's sustainable. Um, and I, I think that you know, the reason why we've struggled to recruit more mentors, and in particular more mentors of color, is that people might question, I don't know if I could be a good mentor. Mm -hmm. uh, they might have, um, one idea in their mind of what a mentor looks like and what kind of profession uh, they might have. But everyone can be a mentor. I think Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said it best when he said everyone can be great because everyone can serve. Right. And this is the way that you can serve. Um, so I've been very passionate about mentoring. I am a big sister myself. Um, and so to all those who are watching, uh, you know, please do consider um, joining Ayana's Big Challenge. And, uh, and signing up to be a mentor uh, through the Big Brother or Big Sister Association. Those wait lists just continue to grow. And I think if you believe in peace, you should support mentoring. If you believe in scholastic excellence, then you should support mentoring. Uh, and through the Big Brother or Big Sister model, you can do that one-on-one, -on -one. you can do that uh, community-based, you can do that school-based. It's a very flexible model, so I hope um, uh, the, the viewers will learn more about that initiative. Yes, I agree with you 100%. Thank um, you. Having benefited from mentoring myself and, and advocating for mentoring all the time with my students and, and friends and just in my own life, you just mentioned scholastic achievement. Yeah. And something that's on a lot of voters' minds is the achievement gap. Um, sh I'm sure that mentoring can help in, in some sense with uh, closing that gap. But what else can you tell us about any new initiatives that you're involved in around education? Well, I think you know, ultimately closing the achievement gap will uh, first begin with our closing the wealth and equity gap. Um, I think you know, our schools are a microcosm of what we see in our society and in our city. Uh, and so you know, we can do whatever we can to improve the rigors of, um, of our curriculum, uh, to create greater autonomy for our principals and teachers, to be flexible, um, to create more uh, options for our parents. Um, but ultimately, we will continue to have an achievement gap for as long as we have inequities and we have poverty. Um, so one of the things um, that I continue to advocate for um, is that we support our young people in their, in their grit and in their uh, resilience um, to ensure that first they're receptive to learning. Um, if they're hungry, they're not going to walk in that building receptive to learning. Right. If there is trauma and drama and dysfunction in their home life, then they're not going to be receptive to learning. Um, and so I've been fighting for a greater investment in social emotional and wellness supports, um, such as psychotherapists and guidance counselors, um, so that we can support our teachers just in being teachers and not playing the role of social worker. Um, the other thing that I, I've been uh, advocating for um, is a greater diversity in our teaching force. Um, I think there's a direct correlation on the number of our black and brown boys um, uh, who are dropping out because they don't see male models. Many of them are being raised in single-parented, female-headed households. They come to schools and they see dynamic, incredible um, you know, teachers such as yourself that are by and large women. Um, so I think we need to have a teaching force that reflects the diversity of our student body. And that's not just racially, uh, ethnically, and culturally, but gender is very important. There's really been a male teacher uh, shortage crisis. Um, so I think um, combating poverty, um, a greater investment in social emotional wellness supports to address those uh, variables, those life variables that get in the way of life and scholastic success is very important. 
uh, and a diverse teaching force. And then the last thing that I would speak to on the health front um, is I've spent um, three years advocating for and will now see it implemented in the BPS wellness policy, a comprehensive sex and health education curriculum uh, that is culturally competent, medically accurate, age appropriate, and includes abstinence. Um, but it's very important um, in our school-based health centers, the two top reasons young people visit are for mental health challenges or sexual health questions. Um, and so I'm very proud of having accomplished that in my uh, council tenure, that that policy will now be in place so that we can take that out of the equation. Because when you have health disparities, what you're gonna see are young people that are chronically uh, tardy, uh, and then chronically absent, and then ultimately on a pathway to drop out. That's absolutely true. Um, you mentioned the, the income disparities, and Boston has been a place that has been unaffordable, unfortunately, for many people. And you certainly have worked hard to make it inclusive, um, to fight discrimination on various fronts. Um, talk a little bit more about your own successes fighting discrimination and, and what we can see, what we can look forward to. Well, I think the first thing that I would say, I said earlier, the best gift we can give a young person is a stable adult. I think one way that we get at this uh, wealth and equity gap is to stabilize adults. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in an economy that is recovering, um, albeit slowly, uh, and in a workforce that is uh, changed dramatically in the 21st century, um, we've got to increase uh, access to educational opportunities for adults too. So we can't only talk about the need uh, to ensure that young people have access to a quality education. The reality is that increasingly so because life gets in the way. More and more adults um, were not able, or rather as young people, were not able to pursue higher education. And now as adults are pursuing those opportunities later in life to stabilize their household so they can be competitive in the workforce. So I'll continue to fight for a greater investment in adult basic education. Uh, in ESOL, we see that those wait lists continue to grow. So there is um, a, a huge need for that. Um, there have been a number of programs uh, that were close to shuttering their doors, and I fought to save those programs. Uh, one in particular uh, in Mattapan, ABCD. And not only were we able to save that um, adult um, basic education and ESOL program, we were also able to increase the capacity. So I will continue to do that because I think when we have uh, stabilize those adults, then they'll be in a better position to provide for their families um, and to grow wealth. Mm -hmm. Well, you certainly have worked so hard and have um, earned the confidence of many, and I'm so proud of everything that you've been thank able to you. Well, we're partners in this work, Doctor. That's so right, and I want proud you, of to, you too. thank you, and I want to know that, I want you to know that you can count on me for ABC, and oh, right. hopefully, as Counselor mentioned, many of you who are watching yes. will join us uh, on this important work, building a brighter future for Boston. Absolutely. Um, in the last few moments, is there anything that you would like to say directly to the viewers and um, encouraging them to mobilize for the 24th? Yes. Uh, so again, my name is Ayanna Presley. I've had the humbling honor of serving as one of your four at-large Boston City Councilors for four years now. I'm running for election to my third term. I'm asking you to consider me for one of your four votes on September 24th so that I can continue to work on these issues that I really see as neighborhood transcendent, issues like poverty and violence and trauma, uh, issues that uh, erode at the fabric of us and, and break the bonds of community. Uh, so I hope you consider me. It's uh, just been my greatest challenge and reward uh, to fight for women and girls and the stabilization of all our families. Uh, and I would like to very much to continue that work. Well before um, I had the honor of serving as an elected official, I you know, really got to know the Haitian community uh, in my capacity uh, as an aide to United States Senator, uh, now our Secretary of State, John Kerry. Uh, I worked with him for 11 years, and prior to that, um, I worked for Congressman Joseph P. Kennedy II, um, who has since retired, but I worked for him for four years, and that was where I first uh, you know, had my introduction to the Haitian community of Boston. It has been very easy for me uh, as an elected official to be an ally and a friend uh, and in solidarity on uh, social justice issues and disparities uh, that face the Haitian community um, because I've long been a friend and an ally well before I was an elected official. It's been uh, wonderful uh, to be in fellowship with the community and to see you at flag raisings, at the Haitian Independence Day Gala, at the parade. You know, every year uh, I'm with you. 
Uh, and, uh, and so it's, I've enjoyed that relationship and I'd be remiss if I didn't acknowledge um, that I would not have been as successful as I have been in my four years on the city council uh, if I did not have a dynamic and talented young Haitian woman at the helm of my policy effort. Uh, my policy director is a young woman named Jackney Prioli. Uh, who is a homegrown Dorchester, a uh, very dynamic young Haitian woman. And so I want to take this uh, opportunity just to thank her for everything that she's done. And thank each and every one of you for what you contribute daily to the city of Boston, uh, culturally uh, and to the economy of our city. And I'm very proud uh, to have enjoyed the support of the Haitian community, and in particular, uh, my sister in service, uh, State Senator Linda Dorsina Fori. Very proud to call her a friend. Uh, and a colleague in government and uh, proud to have earned her endorsement uh, in my election uh, to my third term. Senior Whole Health has a member who was having a very serious eye surgery. Recovery meant sitting 20 hours a day face down, um, picture a massage chair. The member could not afford the $200 rental fee out of pocket. We have um, acquired such a great network of people that we work with. One of our vendors stepped in um, found the piece of equipment, had it delivered overnight to the member so that she was able to start her post-operative care. Senior Whole Health just does what it takes.